Over the past 25 years, Christopher Nolan, often in collaboration with his brother Jonathan, has been perhaps the most consistently compelling filmmaker in Hollywood. But those films have also had recurring criticisms. One, that they were never very good at writing female characters and appear to be getting worse. Two, that they often had more wow factor than emotional impact. And three, that they often undercut the politics and social critique that they initially gestured towards. Despite the scale and creativity of the Nolans' films, their scripts are using a deceptively simple formula that they've had in place since their breakthrough indie hit called Following from the 1990s. This formula replaces character with backstory. Usually there are two male leads. One is suave, the other is rough around the edges. At first they appear calm, cool, collected, in control of the situation, but gradually as we go into their backstory, we find it is messed up beyond belief, and at the very end of the back-end loaded script, a deception that has been at the heart of their relationship from the very beginning is revealed and all the pieces fall into place. In following, the two leads were robbers. In Memento, they pushed this formula to brilliant extremes by having a character with no short-term memory, so everything was backstory to be rigorously unveiled one step at a time. In The Prestige, which I think was their greatest aesthetic achievement, the two characters are magicians. With some minor tweaks to the stock characters, the same basic formula was used to explore time travel and incepted dreams. The trouble with this structure is that it reduces any play or film or book to the intellectual satisfaction of solving a puzzle. There aren't really any characters. There's no real internal action, transformation of people, as they experience the present moment. Instead, we are merely trying to solve the external action. A person is presented as a puzzle to be solved. We go back and find out what was the actual sequence of events that happened, so that at the end of the film we can go, ah, got it. This tendency to reduce everything to the intellectual satisfaction of solving a puzzle has always undercut the social and political critique that they've at least gestured towards having in most of their films. Often they completely bail on that critique by the end of the film in order to focus on the entertainment value of the big reveal. And as David Graeber rightly pointed out, the Dark Knight trilogy actually ended with a right-wing reactionary film that was very at odds with what they had been building up until that point. Batman was, of course, the natural superhero for the Nolans to take on, a suave billionaire with a secret identity from the traumas and phobias embedded in his backstory. The Dark Knight trilogy actually did look at the justified outrage, at the corruption and decay of neoliberal capitalism. But by the end of the third film, everyone who had tried to transform things had had some dark ulterior motive and had to be killed so that the very status quo that had produced them could be reinstated. Bane and his followers actually have a showdown with the police at the New York Stock Exchange, just after Barack Obama had broken up the Occupy Wall Street movement with military force. This gets us to Oppenheimer. Christopher Nolan said he was particularly motivated to make this movie when he realized his own child thought the threat of nuclear war didn't really exist anymore. In reality, it perhaps is stronger today than it was at the heart of the Cold War. Nolan seems to take this threat very seriously. He still writes female characters terribly. But the development of a nuclear world is rendered spectacularly for the first 60% of the film. This includes not just the ambiguity around making such a powerful weapon. It also includes the politics of the era with no McCarthyist gloss. Capitalism has crashed into the Great Depression. The American government is suppressing left-wing movements by supporting fascism in Spain. Many of the top American scientists are left-wingers, but facing Adolf Hitler, they are compelled to support the American government in the development of the most powerful weapon of all time. This does not appear to be a film that will cut corners until it does. It's time for the Nolan reveal. It was Strauss all along. Remember the other male lead? Louis Strauss, Robert Downey Jr., he sort of buds with Oppenheimer trying to get him an Ivy League appointment, but actually held a grudge against him from a time he sort of embarrassed him from before on a different issue and uh, was uh, uh, actually trying to get his security clearance revoked in 1954, which would have been his, his access to secret documents as an employee of the United States government. And Strauss is also trying to get into the U.S. cabinet. And there's sort of drama around that. For the last hour of the film, there are only a few scattered phrases about the nuclear world that has been developed, most of which are completely misleading. The film is reduced to the entertainment value of finding out that Strauss was the bad guy all along, and whether or not Oppenheimer got robbed when his personal security clearance was revoked in 1954. 
The McCarthyist context of his hearing is brought up, but it's actually kind of acquiesced to, in a total about face from the first half of the film. I don't know that I've ever seen a movie so bail on itself. So let's pick up where the film abandons us. It is not the case that the US government, military, or scientific community felt they needed to drop this bomb. On the contrary, it was not only widely known that Japan was desperate for decent surrender conditions, but it was the position of General MacArthur, a total war hawk, that the US could have ended the war months earlier if they had adjusted those surrender conditions. Most of the top American military brass opposed dropping the bomb on Japan, including General Eisenhower. Leo Szilard and many of the top physicists signed a letter saying, do not drop this bomb. The war was over. The U.S. wanted to drop it as a show of might. And that show of might was probably as much for the Soviet Union, still purportedly their allies, as it was about Japan. 85% of the casualties were civilians. 32 years ago, the last pretext for the military-industrial complex collapsed. The Soviet Union was no more. And the military-industrial complex continued as if nothing had happened. This isn't about Oppenheimer's security clearance from 1954. This is about empire, backed by the threat that is very real of nuclear winter. And we don't need Batman to come in and save it. We need citizens to end it.